Okay, so welcome to this next video in which we are discussing uh, the uh, use of the beta-2 agonists in the treatment of uh, asthma. Okay, so we've seen overall that there are uh, two different forms of uh, treatment with beta-2 agonists. We've seen that there are these short-acting beta-2 agonists, such as salbutamol and tabutamine, uh, which uh, are given uh, to, for administration via inhaler uh, when you're having an asthmatic attack, okay? And they work by relaxing the smooth muscle cells and helping to reopen the airways if you're having an acute asthmatic attack. Okay, and therefore help you to uh, breathe again, basically more normally. Okay, and prevent asphyxiation. Okay, um, whereas in more severe and more persistent asthma, you also give an actual prophylactic beta two agonist, such as salmeterol or formeterol, uh, which is to be administered twice daily, and this is a longer acting beta two agonist. So the time for which it actually works is longer, okay, and this is why uh, it can be given twice daily because it will act for around 12 hours before you then need re-delivery of the drug, okay. Now this works to actually prevent you having an asthmatic attack. Now firstly it relaxes the smooth muscle cells just as the um, short-acting beta-2 agonist did and therefore um, you are keeping your airways nice and open, okay. Uh, and the drug is there if you should have an asthma attack, then it is already there and already delivered, and hopefully will t try and prevent symptoms from actually arising in the first place. In addition, it also acts on mast cells and will stop them from releasing the mediators uh, which trigger the uh, asthmatic attack, i.e. trigger the inflammatory response in the lamina propria and also the contraction of the smooth muscle cells. Okay, and thereby it can help to prevent the uh, asthma attack from ever being initiated in the first place. Okay, so there are these two ways that we use beta-2 agonists. Now, we're currently in the uh, process of trying to understand how they actually cause relaxation of the smooth muscle cells, which is this key way that these beta-2 agonists uh, work to relieve an asthmatic attack. Okay, so we've seen that um, the beta-2 agonist will bind to the beta-2 adrenergic receptor, which is on the surface of these smooth muscle cells. And that will trigger the activation of the alpha-S GTP subunit of the heterotromeric GSG protein. This will then go and activate an adenylyl cyclase enzyme, which is going to produce cyclic AMP. And cyclic AMP is going to work on our uh, enzyme protein kinase A, which is also, by the way, also known as the cyclic, whoops, cyclic AMP uh, dependent kinase, okay? And you'll definitely see cyclic AMP dependent kinase used if you read the um, primary and secondary research literature. Uh, they, for some reason, prefer to use cyclic AMP dependent kinase than protein kinase A. Student fem student-friendly uh, reviews tend to put cyclic AMP-dependent protein kinase and then in brackets PKA um, to help you along a bit. Um, but some just use cyclic AMP-dependent kinase, so be aware of that. Okay, so there are two different types of um, cyclic AMP-dependent kinase or protein kinase A. However, they do not differ in the catalytic subunit. All protein kinase A enzymes have the same catalytic subunit. The two different types differ in which regulatory subunit you have. Now, the regulatory subunit does not actually catalyze uh, the uh, adding on of a phosphate group onto uh, the serine and threonine residues of proteins. Instead, it binds to the catalytic subunit and forms this R2C2 complex in this way. And when the catalytic subunit is bound to the regulatory subunit, it's inactive. In addition, the regulatory subunit can either bind to other proteins that are in the plasma membrane, okay, in the case of the R2 domains, or it can bind to nothing in the case of the R1 enzymes. Um, and that uh, leads to the enzyme uh, being in the cytoplasm of the cell. So if you use two R1 regulatory subunits of protein kinase A, then you get a 
type 1 protein kinase A enzyme, and if you use 2R2 uh, regulatory subunits of protein kinase A, then you get a protein kinase A type 2. Okay, so cyclic AMP is going to activate both of them the same. So, four cyclic AMP molecules will bind uh, in these cyclic AMP binding sites. So each regulatory subunit has two cyclic AMP binding sites. So, let's say four cyclic AMP molecules come along, and what's going to happen is it's going to cause a change in conformation of the regulatory subunits. So let me show this. So it causes a dramatic change in conformation like so. Okay, so now we've got cyclic AMP bound in these four cyclic AMP binding sites. So let me highlight these cyclic AMP molecules in, in vivid purple. Okay, so here's the cyclic AMP molecule, here's the cyclic AMP molecule, here's the cyclic AMP molecule, and here's the cyclic AMP molecule. So they've been uh, demoted somewhat from actually having their little cartoon drawn out to just being a blob now. So this represents cyclic AMP. Okay, so when you get these four cyclic AMP molecules binding, this changes the conformation of the protein kinase A enzyme, and the regulatory subunits now release the catalytic subunits. So here are the two catalytic subunits going off. And these are now going to phosphorylate uh, serine and threonine residues within proteins. Okay, now what is the target for uh, protein kinase A's catalytic subunit now? Uh, because they're now active, okay? Well, one of the key targets that's believed to be key in causing smooth muscle relaxation is something known as the large uh, conductance potassium channel. Okay, so let's discuss this. The large conductance potassium channel. Okay, and this is often referred to um, as the BK channel, okay? Now, it is a calcium uh, dependent, well, it's a calcium activated uh, potassium channel, but it's also voltage gated as well. So, large conductance potassium channel, also often called the BK channel, which stands for just big potassium channel, basically. And when it opens, uh, it can conduct a lot of potassium ions through it, so its ability to conduct potassium ions is very, very high. Okay, so, uh, it is a calcium-activated um, potassium channel, so calcium going up within the cytoplasm of the cell can activate uh, this channel. In addition, however, it's also voltage-activated, so it's not just calcium that can activate it, it can also be activated by voltage. Now, it is considered a calcium-gated potassium channel, okay? Now, there are uh, many different families of calcium-gated potassium channels, okay? They're split generally into five main families, okay? So, you have the KCA1 family, okay? And it goes all the way down to the KCA5 family. So, let me show you how you conduct sorry, how you produce a large conductance potassium channel. Okay, so let me draw one of these things for you, and then I'll explain its um, build-up. Okay, so I'll draw a nice big channel here. Right, so, basically it's a tetramer. It's made of four polypeptides, which are all joined together. So it's not just one polypeptide, it's loads of polypeptides, it's all stuck together, four to be specific, and then we're going to see that there's actually more that you can add on in a moment, but for now we'll just concentrate on the four main pieces. Okay, so, these four main pieces come together to make uh, the full um, large conductance potassium channel here, so you need one, two, three, four. Now, they are all identical, basically, they're all encoded by the identical gene, which is this gene KCA1, okay? So, we use this KCA1 gene, so we go to the uh, potassium, the, sorry, the calcium-gated potassium channels. Now, there are these five different families of um, KCA genes, okay, which can code for a quarter of a calcium-activated potassium channel, 
okay? Uh, we use specifically a member of this KCA1 family, but there is only one member of this KCA1 family, which is the KCA1 gene. Okay, so we go to this KCA1 gene, and uh, we uh, transcribe and translate this four times, and stick these four proteins together to make uh, the um, calcium-activated uh, potassium channel, which is the large conductance potassium channel, or the BK channel. So the whole thing is what will be called the BK channel. And basically, it's made from a tetramer of these KCA1 genes. Now, uh, these families over here, these KCA1, KCA2, KCA3, KCA4, all the way down to KCA5, these are the ways that you split up the alpha subunits, okay? So, when you are building a calcium-activated potassium channel, you need alpha subunits and you also need beta subunits, okay? The alpha subunits are what you put together to make um, the ring here, okay? So you use four alpha subunits. Now, if you want to conduct a BK, so if you want to produce a BK channel, you need to use four of these KCA1 genes to make your four separate alpha subunits here, okay? That gives you a BK channel. However, you can also add in beta subunits onto this. So let me show you the beta subunits. And for this, I'll draw a picture from above. Okay, so here's the circle from above. So we're looking now from above here. Okay, so here are these four separate alpha subunits, which are all KCA1 subunits, okay, that are all stuck together in this tetramer that makes this pore which, through which potassium can move. Now, these are all identical proteins, and I'll show you the structure of those in a moment, okay? But firstly, let's talk about the beta subunits. So you can add in four beta subunits, which I'll show like this. One, two, three, and then four here. So these are all beta subunits which sort of attach on. So you get one beta subunit for each alpha subunit as well. Okay, and they sort of sit in the uh, gaps between the two neighboring alpha subunits here. Okay, so these are beta subunits, and there are three different beta subunits that you can use. So there's beta 1, beta 2, beta 3. So this widens the scope of large conductance potassium channels that you can actually produce. Okay, so let me show these in light green here. So in light green, these are the beta subunits. Okay, and then... Uh, we'll have the alpha subunits in red here. Okay, so in red, these are the alpha subunits. And we know that the alpha subunits are all encoded by the same gene, KCA1. However, there's more variation than you would think because there are different splice variants of the KCA1 gene. So these proteins that make up the... Um, alpha subunits, they might not actually all be identical. They might have different splice variants, so you might include different exons, basically. Okay, but their overall structure is similar enough that they <laughs> perform the same function. Okay, so you put four of these KCA1 proteins together, and then you can put one of these uh, three uh, beta subunits together. Okay, right. Uh, now, um, Let's talk about the actual structure of one of these KCA1 proteins. So, one of these KCA1 proteins, if we pull it out of the membrane and now look at its membrane-spanning topology, what we'll find is something that looks like this. So it has seven membrane-spanning regions. So this is four, five, six. Then it has something known as the p-loop, where you dip into the membrane and then don't quite make it through. And then it's got its seventh domain there. And then it has two domains inside, okay, here, known as the RCK1 and the RCK2. Okay, so uh, RCK stands for the Regulator of Conductance of Potassium Domain. Okay, so this one here, this is the RCK1 domain, and this one over here is the RCK2. Right, and this stands for the Regulator of conductance of potassium. Regulator of conductance of potassium. Okay, so R is for regulator, C is for conductance, and K is for potassium. 
Okay, so we're using the periodic table symbol for potassium. Okay, so those are the regulator of conductance of potassium domain 1 and the regulator of conductance of potassium domain 2. Okay, so let's colour those two in. So here in orange are the regulator of conductance of potassium domains. Okay, and now let's label up some of these uh, membrane spanning regions. Okay, so the first membrane spanning alpha helix over here is labelled the S0 membrane spanning alpha helix. Then uh, the next one over here is labelled the S1 membrane spanning alpha helix, then S2, then S3, then S4, then S5, and then are on to S6. So you continue counting on basically. There are seven overall. One of them is called S0, so the next six are then called S1 for S6. And this little loop where you dip in is known as the P loop. Okay, like that. So those are the key structures here S0 to S6, and then the P loop, and then these two RCK1s and RCK2s. So Four of these assemble round uh, to make the whole pore, okay? And underneath, on the cytoplasmic domain, you have uh, eight RCK1, uh, well, eight, eight RCK domains, because you have four overall proteins here, okay? Each of them has two RCK domains, so those also actually assemble into a ring, so underneath what you have is another ring, so... How am I going to show this? I'll draw it down here. So underneath here, basically, what you'll have is another ring here. And this will be made up of the RCK uh, domains, okay? So if I draw this out now, basically you'll have another sort of ringed pore structure, and it will be made up of these eight RCK domains, okay? So, like so. So each subunit will provide in two RCK domains. So, for instance, these RCK domains here will be the regulator of potassium conductance, um, sorry, regulator of conductance of potassium domains corresponding to this first alpha subunit here, okay, and so on, and they form a nice ring underneath it as well. Okay, now these are the portions where the calcium actually binds to, okay, and this is how calcium can activate these channels to open. So, for instance, on the... Um, in these regulator of conductance of potassium domains, you have calcium binding sites, which are called calcium bowls. And when calcium binds to those, those calcium bowls, it can trigger uh, the um, channel to open and therefore conduct potassium. Okay. In addition, they're voltage-gated, like other voltage-gated potassium channels, so depolarization of the electrical potential difference across the membrane can also cause them uh, to open. Okay, right, so we now need to discuss what protein kinase A is going to do. So the catalytic subunit of protein kinase A is now going to come and phosphorylate these channels, basically, their cytoplasmic domains. And this is going to result in uh, increased open probability of the channel. So it's going to increase the sensitivity of these channels to calcium and uh, also to voltage. So the amount of time that these channels will spend in an open state is going to increase.